All right, thanks for joining us. In this video, we're going to take a look at the concepts of assignment 7.2, freshwater pollution. So here's an interesting uh, and serious comment from the World Commission on Water 1999. Seriously depleted and polluted, degrading and poisoning the surrounding ecosystems, threatening the health and livelihood of people who depend on them is what half of the major rivers are today. And I want to you to test your understanding here. Multiple mark, which are them are points and which of them are non-point sources of water pollution. So um, go ahead and pause it. Welcome back. So golf course, point or non-point? We would say non-point on that. For B, point. C, non-point. D, point. E, non-point. F, point or maybe non-point. This diagram from our textbook um, illustrates it and basically it comes down to how big of a thing is it. If it's a small feedlot, you might think of it as point source. If it's a really big one, then non-point. Types of water pollution, eutrophication, we've talked about this a lot. Um, just kind of let you, you can pause if you want to review it there. But excess nutrients, that's the problem with that. Pathogens, we talk about pathogens as being disease causing germs. Waterborne disease from viruses, bacteria, etc., contributes to 5 million deaths per year. And in 2002, 1.1 billion people were still without safe water supplies. That's practically one in seven. And 2.4 billion people had no sewer or sanitation facilities, but that's like one out of three. That's, uh, that's amazing. And some of the nastier ones that we may have heard about are salmonella, um, E. coli poisoning, streptococcus, we see strep show up in strep throat, staphylococcus, sometimes people get staph infections that are sometimes really hard to treat with antibiotics. Some of them are even flesh eating. And four out of five people without sanitation were living in rural areas. Um, I think we'd have to add on here to people living in slum areas outside of cities. As far as toxic chemicals go, many thousands of chemicals we manufacture find their way into our water where some have toxic effects. So we're talking about pesticides, and we'll actually look into that more depth in our next unit on environmental health and toxicology. Petroleum products, you can see the sheen at the right with a guy going through the water. And arsenic, lead, and mercury and other metals. Uh, heavy metal poisoning is a serious thing. And acids from mining runoff and acid precipitation, those are all toxic chemicals. So as far as the mercury one goes here, there's a boy from Japan who suffered poisoning from a methyl, um, methyl mercury um, that was released by a Japanese chemical company back all, actually for over almost four decades from 1932 to 1968 they were releasing mercury as part of their um, of their chemical processes manufacturing and has caused a number of problems including involuntary muscle contraction like you can see with this boy numbness, impaired vision, insanity you may have heard the term the mad hatter they used to use hats to make felt and um, birth defects and, and death. We'll see that more in our next unit. Acid mine drainage is when water that fills abandoned mines becomes acidic as it reacts with sulfur in the exposed rock. This makes sulfuric acid and it's a major problem associated with mining. It can be prevented by covering the exposed rock with dirt and there are some areas that don't even look like mines anymore because they've been covered up with dirt with new vegetation growing on top and that's a good way to deal with it. And here we see yellow iron precipitates in a stream receiving acid drainage from surface coal mining. All right, sediment's another big problem. We see that when we have erosion of soil from mining, clear cutting, real estate development. If you think about when you see building happening around town, they first basically strip the area of vegetation so it's just dirt, and then they begin doing their construction. And farming also, these all put sediment into waterways. Some effects we can see here that turbid turbidity increases um, in a huge way, which means photosynthesis decreases because there's no light getting in, which means dissolved oxygen decreases because there's not photosynthesis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Things die. That's the ultimate effect. And fish gills can get clogged just from that. Uh, it can it can interfere with their eggs for reproduction, and also the temperature can increase as water gets shallower from deposited sediment. Heat and cold is another type of pollution of water. Yes, they can pollute. Organisms that are not adapted to the new temperature conditions can suffer or die. And here we see warm water from power plants, which decreases dissolved oxygen. So there's this relationship. As the water gets warmer, the molecules start moving faster and they start kicking out the oxygen into the air. So there's less of it left dissolved. And also clearing streamside vegetation warms water because there's less shade. 
And uh, even cold water held behind dams, when it's released, it harms native fish downstream that aren't used to that you know, cold water shock. Because basically behind the dam you have a huge body of water which has a lot of thermal inertia so it generally stays cooler. But the water in the stream where the fish are would be warmer. So some water quality indicators, we use biological properties. We look for the presence of pathogens which are disease causing organisms. They may be present making water risky for drinking. And here we see E. coli which may be found in water that is contaminated with feces from an infected animal or human. And we generally call these type of bacteria coliform, so E. coli, coliform. And chemical properties, lots of them. We talked about nutrient concentrations. Uh, phosphorus uh, is one of those things that results in foam. If you look at a stream and it, you see when it's flowing that there's some foam hanging out there, that's usually from phosphorus, which can be from uh, runoff from detergents. And you know, basically most a lot of detergents nowadays are manufactured to be phosphate free, but in the past that wasn't always the case. And um, also there's some natural seepage or natu natural um, leaching of phosphate from rock into the water, so it's not all from humans. pH is another chemical property, and taste and odor can show the presence of certain chemical contaminants. You know, back to pH for just a moment. Um, if you have water that's, that has too, um, either too high or too low of a pH, that's going to interfere with organisms because you know you wouldn't you would not like to drink water that was highly acidic or highly basic it just wouldn't taste right it would interfere with your body in a negative way uh, taste and odor can show presence of certain chemical contaminants such as sulfur if you ever tasted or smelled water that had sulfur in it you'll know immediately because it smells like rotten eggs hardness hard water has high concentrations of dissolved salts especially calcium and magnesium and they can leave behind like water deposits that are hard to clean on your faucets Dissolved oxygen, DO, this indicates suitability for life. High DO is generally good for fish and amphibian life. A lot of fish need at least four to, you know, four to eight. Um, I think it's uh, milligrams per liter or something like that, I forget. And BOD, biological oxygen demand, this indicates the level of organic matter. The more organic matter you have, the more oxygen is needed or demanded by the decomposers to break it down. So a little quiz here for you. Acid rain can have a pH of 5.0. How much more acidic is lemon juice, which has a pH of 2.0? So um, multiple choice, go ahead and pause, choose your answer. Okay, if you said E a thousand times more acidic, you were correct. And how this works is when we have water, H2O, it can separate into OH, which is called a hydroxyl ion, and H+, which is called a hydrogen ion. Um, and um, so uh, if you have more H pluses than OH minuses, then it's called acidic. And these um, H pluses are very good at um, dissolving things by going in and taking the place of other metal ions. If you have more OHs than Hs, then you would call it basic. And the way the scale works, as you've seen already, pH of seven is neutral. Anything higher than that is for basic, anything lower than that is acidic. We can see a sort of range here. Lemon juice is highly acidic. Car battery acid, very acidic. Rainwater, normal rainwater is slightly acidic. Acid rain can be as acidic as 4.0. And then things like um, soap is basic. And um, what else? Seawater is slightly basic. And the, the one big point about this is the pH scale is logarithmic, which means every integer step is a change in 10 times in hydrogen ion concentration. So for example, pH 5 is 10 times more acidic than pH 6, and pH 3 is 100 times more acidic than pH 5, because 3, 4, 5, there's, that's two steps, 3 to 4, 4 to 5, each step is times 10, so times 10 times 10 is times 100. As far as physical properties, we look at turbidity, the density of the suspended particles. Water with sediments from erosion is turbid. And we talk about color, indicates tannins, which come from the decomposition of organic matter and other chemicals. Uh, I remember going swimming in a river in Pensacola, Florida, and the river basically looked like tea. And it was from the breakdown of some of the leaves, which releases tannins. In fact, you know, same thing when you have tea, you're, you're having um, tea leaves. And so those tannins are, the, are from that. Okay, so temperature is another thing, obviously, and aquatic organisms prefer certain temperatures, as we already talked about. All right, I'm going to pause here, and you should come back for the next part where we 